current and future bilateral relationship between Norway and the United Kingdom. Considering the scope of this relationship, we have a large canvas to paint in the next hour. Luckily then, we have assembled a panel with genuine insight and expertise on these matters. First, representing the United Kingdom, we are joined by the ambassador from the United Kingdom to the Kingdom of Norway, Richard Wood. We're also in the company of Audun Holvorsen, he's State Secretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in Norway and a member of the Conservative Party. And finally, Kristin Haugvik is Senior Researcher here at NUPI, and as part of a wide research portfolio, she has studied British-Norwegian relations in the last 75 years more closely than most. I would like to extend my gratitude to you all for being present. And let me also say that even though uh, we are sitting in an empty room here at NUPI, we know that a lot of you are following this at home. And uh, whereas we are sorry that we're not able to uh, welcome people at NUPI yet, we will do our best to interact with you, which is something we value greatly. So there will be a Q&A session later, and I encourage you to submit your questions using the chat function in Teams already now. And when you do so, please uh, state your name and your affiliation if you have one. So to start off, I do think it's safe to say that as a precursor to the conversation, Norway and the UK are close friends and allies, and that the relationship certainly has a history. Norway initially wanted to preserve a neutral position in world politics when it became an independent state in 1905 in order to stay outside of the alliances that could drag it into adventurous wars with its European neighbours. So that was the thinking back then. But however, as the UK was the superior of the sea with a global reach in trade and shipping at the time, there was a hope in Norway that the UK could commit to some sort of implicit security guarantee. And relations among the countries developed incrementally along those lines in the early 1900s. What is more, the UK figure in some of the most important moments in history and indeed the identity of Norway. One is of course the monarchy, as Norway's uh, King Håkon, uh, he was married to King Edward VII's daughter, Maud, so the choice of that particular couple, including the son who eventually became King Olaf V, established a direct bloodline between the Norwegian and British monarchies. Something that at the time was alluded to in Norway as strengthening the Norwegian-British uh, bilateral relationship. Second, arguably the most important moment in recent Norwegian history was the German invasion uh, in 1940 and the narrow escape of the king. He, as we all know, together with the other leaders in the state apparatus, fled to London and ran the country from there during the war. And following that war, Norwegian neutrality was history and the UK was going to be one of Norway's closest allies in world politics. Now, the world has changed a lot since these early days of the relationship. And as with all seminars on world political issues these days, the current changes accentuates, uh, accentuates the need also to discuss the Norwegian-British relationship today and into the future. For one, the world is unstable in a broader sense in, in how the tectonic plates of world politics are shifting. Some would say away from the US-led liberal international order or the rules-based order that both Norway and the UK have been closely tied into since 1945. There is more rivalry between great powers and political blocs. Europe is arguably becoming less relevant in this global uh, image. And there are new kinds of challenges emerging, particularly related to technological advances, digital disinformation campaigns, and of course, global pandemics. Norway and the UK will soon tackle these issues together in the UN Security Council, as Norway has been elected a member of the council for 2021 and 22. In addition to the external challenges, there are also internal challenges to the community of states that Norway and the UK are part of. I'm thinking especially of the UK's decision to leave the European Union. In fact, the Norwegian government was an active remainer in the campaign that led up to the British referendum on EU membership. Then Minister of European Affairs, Vidar Helgesen, warned in The Guardian already in 2015 that the UK would lose influence in world politics if it left the EU. And I quote, that at the time of a burning security crisis, not seen since the Cold War, most key meetings are now being convened at EU level rather than within NATO, and it is vital that the UK is there to shape decisions." End of quote. As we are well aware of, the UK left the EU earlier this year. So the UK the, began to try to forge a new direction as global Britain. The negotiations between the parties have reached yet another crucial moment in these days. The parties must agree on the future relationship within a month's time. Otherwise, the UK will, as it goes, crash out of the single market on January 1st. Norway is also negotiating a future relationship with the EU. We know that uh, Norway signed a fisheries agreement with the UK last week. Even German Chancellor Angela Merkel noticed this and she commented with hope that it might have been evidence that the British might still actually be constructive in negotiating with its European partners. But Norway is also negotiating a free trade agreement with the UK, but we do not know as of now how well it's going 
or if it's possible to agree on it by the end of the year. Perhaps we will know more after this seminar. Uh, but for now, let's begin with the opening remarks from the panelists. And I will remind you that you can submit questions already now um, in the chat function on Teams, and I will do my best to address them later on in the seminar. But first, the word is your ambassador, Richard Wood. Thank you very much. And I think that was a very interesting uh, introduction, which set a very wide context. That's exactly what I would want to do is to remind people that actually um, there is a very long and very wide history between uh, the UK and Norway. And there has been a fascination, which I perfectly well understand over the last three years or so to talk about uh, Brexit and to uh, obsess a little bit about how the negotiations are going step by step. Um, but actually, I think if we take a much wider perspective, we will see that the relationship has evolved several times over many, many uh, years and generations. Uh, and that is exactly what we are doing now in the negotiations that you described over a free trade agreement, fisheries, school exchanges, students, and many, many more areas which define the relationship much better than the narrow context of uh, what are we doing inside or with the EEA and the EU or what are we doing outside. So, you know, this is a relationship that goes back uh, over a thousand years, blood ties, geographic ties. We were the first country that, uh, uh, Norway was one of the first countries that invaded the UK uh, and uh, one of the first countries that uh, we did trade with many, many um, years and generations ago. So the relatively recent context of 45 years within the European Union is a blip in a very long, uh, a very long um, historical context. And I think it's really um, important to remember the, the things that that relationship has been founded on all along. And I will get to what, how the world is changing and how we need to adapt, but it has always been based on um, common security, common trade, common prosperity, uh, and facing many challenges um, together as we need to do as geographic neighbors. So it is a, an extraordinarily long uh, and deep uh, relationship. We have parts of the UK, Orkney and Shetland, that still use the Nordic Cross as their uh, flag. Uh, many of us are descended from uh, Viking blood. Um, so these are really deep um, uh, parts of the relationship, deep ties, which you cannot uh, easily uh, break and we need to find a way to move um, forward on. So I'll try and get Brexit out of the way because I think uh, I know you wanted to make this a seminar about Brexit and I know people will want to ask me about Brexit and that's fine. Um, but I think, as I said, it is a small part of uh, and not a defining part of the relationship. But I will comment, as you said, um, UK and Norway are um, negotiating currently the whole of the future relationship um, uh, through free trade and all those other areas that I mentioned. It is going extremely well. Free trade agreements take years and years to um, negotiate normally. And um, we have come close to uh, final agreement on a free trade agreement in a matter of a couple of months. Uh, and the reason for that is um, very, very clear. A, we are close together uh, because we share a common rules framework already. And B, we have very um, shared interests in making sure that we can secure trade, uh, contact between people, research collaboration, and all of the other things uh, in the future. So um, we, aren't, we aren't done yet. We need to um, have a final spurt to finish off those uh, negotiations. But I'm really confident that we um, will get that done um, uh, very soon and be able to, uh, to move on. So that's where we are in the negotiations with Norway. And what has made that complicated is the fact that quite a lot of that hangs off the relationship with the European Union which, as you know, has been a more difficult um, set of negotiations that we've been trying to uh, trying to engage in. Um, I think the fisheries agreement that you referenced with Norway is a good example of the difference between the two. Um, that fisheries uh, agreement with Norway took um, a matter of a couple of weeks to uh, agree. It's a very sensible, forward looking fisheries agreement based on science and zonal attachment which is all about sustainable um, fisheries, sustainable catch, uh, equitable share of um, common resources in the North Sea. Uh, and that we were able to agree on extremely quickly. Um, that hasn't proved the basis on which uh, our negotiation with the EU has been able to move forward, sadly. 
and we still hope there is time to uh, uh, to make an agreement with the EU based on those kinds of um, principles. Um, there's also a tendency not just to focus on uh, Brexit in the relationship, but all the things that will change. And some things will change. We have a different framework which governs the rules in some areas. But the vast majority of things simply won't change, either because they were outside the EU's framework in the first place, um, such as fisheries. We've been able to do a, a, a negotiation with Norway that doesn't really relate to the common fisheries policy. Uh, such as defence, where the cornerstone of our uh, relationship is uh, within NATO and within many of the sub-regional uh, uh, mechanisms that have been set up, like the Northern Group and JEF and, and others, and a lot of bilateral military uh, to military relationships, or many other areas where th there was simply no EU framework and we can simply carry on. So although I understand people like to talk about the things that might change, uh, there are an awful lot of things that won't. Now, the title uh, in a changing world, I think, is extremely um, relevant. I've been a diplomat a very long time, and 30 years ago, we were not talking about cyber uh, threats. We were not talking about disinformation in order to undermine democracy. We were not thinking about international terrorist groups gaining access to nuclear or chemical uh, weapons. We were not really even talking about climate change. And all of these things have become a central part of um, all of our foreign policy. And I think um, security has a much broader definition than it used to. It used to be about hot wars, cold wars, uh, and now it is about hybrid threats to uh, our common security. And that's why it's um, and those kinds of threats actually require more international and not less international. So those who think that Brexit was an excuse for us to withdraw uh, from the international stage and become less international, I would argue it's the exact opposite. You will see us in fact um, chairing the COP26 climate talks uh, next year and building up to that. You'll see us um, in a campaign right now on media freedom throughout the world because that threatens our democracy and our common security. You'll see us um, talking loudly about human rights in Xinjiang and in Hong Kong because the security of the world depends on common um, values which Norway and the UK share. And Brexit has already happened. It was several months ago. And I would argue you have not seen us shrink away from uh, international um, issues and international standpoints, rather the opposite. Um, we are out and about. We are talking about issues. We are raising global issues. Uh, we convened a vaccines meeting in London for COVID-19. Um, so I think that definition of security, we have embraced the fact that it is now much wider than it used to be uh, and embraced the challenges there. Um, on pure defence, if you like, um, you'll see um, more than a thousand British troops in Norway this winter training as they always do. Increasingly, that is with Norway and not um, just in Norway. Uh, they're not just skiing, uh, skiing around, learning how to do Arctic warfare. They're working with Norway on interoperable common um, defence, which I think is really, really uh, important. And the UK and, the, and Norway, I think, are the staunchest European NATO allies in understanding uh, the, the threats and responding to those threats with active plans to um, contribute to common defence. Um, I mentioned cyber as well. I think um, there have been recent cyber attacks uh, in Norway, as they have in the rest of Europe and in, in the UK. Uh, and that is one area where we are seeking uh, more cooperation um, and working together in order to identify how to stay ahead of some of those uh, threats. Um, but I think it's in multilateralism that actually um, the UK and Norway's common values on a whole range of international issues is most clearly seen. And we work in complementary ways, uh, I think, very often. So Norway and the UK are one of uh, are two of only five, I think, countries in the world that meet the OECD target of 0.7% of GNI uh, on development. Norway does even better than 0.7%, but um, we're there as well. Um, and I think that um, what we've both tried to do is to come together, cooperate, see where there are programs which we ca can have real effect in ending poverty, in addressing 
um, global health challenges in looking at girls education and literacy programs so that we can um, see that as a as a part of our fundamental approach to security uh, in the world. And I absolutely welcome Norway coming on to the Security Council from January because I think that will introduce a real um, perspective into Security Council debates, which is uh, fantastic to see because it will be based on global values, conflict resolution and the same understanding of security challenges that we have. But also in the WTO, for example, another organisation where the UK and Norway will be uh, independent uh, members. I think there's great scope for collaboration on um, world trade, on making sure that world trade, um, that there is some international world order in trade issues and that there is a, a, a development perspective introduced into uh, world trade as well. But I think one of the things that I really want to stress is that the relationship between the UK and Norway cannot rest on history. Uh, it cannot rest on stories of the royals and the war. Uh, those things are important because they provide a foundation for where this relationship came from, but it must also evolve to reflect what are the concerns of people uh, these days in both our societies. And young people overwhelmingly are interested in um, addressing climate change and the climate emergency that we see before us. And there, I think we have a particularly uh, good story to tell of how UK uh, Norwegian cooperation is leading the way in the world. UK is now the world's largest off offshore wind market. And we announced fortuitously yesterday uh, that every single home in the UK will be powered by offshore wind by 2030, which has been a huge undertaking. Uh, and that couldn't have been done without Norwegian investment in the UK. Um, common challenges, common resources across the North Sea, common answers to some technological challenges. And I think that um, uh, that, uh, and we're doing the same on hydrogen production, uh, for example. So these are new challenges that UK and Norway have been adapting to um, work together. So I will sum up by saying, I think um, shared values and shared geography have given us our history and given us the basis of our relationship. Um, but it's up to us now to show that that can be made into a modern, relevant uh, relationship because in the end, people don't care about um, uh, the relationship to the European Court of Justice or um, which element of the common fisheries policy and quotas are governed in which agreement. They care about um, their own security, prosperity, uh, and solidarity in the world. And those are the things which I think this relationship espouses and which we can build on. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Let's now turn to our Norwegian voice here in State Secretary, uh, Agnor Norwood. Well, first of all, thank you to the Ambassador for, for providing us, I think, with an excellent uh, overview of the relationship. Uh, and I, I agree uh, completely, uh, I have to say, with, with almost everything you, you said. Uh, I thought I would focus my remarks basically along the same three broad subjects, so to say. A few words on the bilateral relationship in general right now and how we see that uh, evolving. Uh, a few words on security and then uh, also some words on, on the bilateral processes related to, to Brexit. Uh, which are, as you said, uh, initially also ongoing. And of course, the the, uh, the point of departure is that this is such a close relationship. We are allies, we are trading partners, we are close friends. There's a long history of strong ties, of cooperation, and it goes back centuries or even millennia. Uh, and it has, it exists on so many levels, uh, politically, economically, when it comes to trade and security, and not least the people-to-people -people ties and all the cultural aspects of that that joint and shared uh, history and experience. And talking to Norwegians today, I think you know, the UK is, is one of our favorite countries, sort of if you look at the broad population in, in Norway, it's the place people want to go to study, it's the place they want to go to, to shop, it's the place where Norwegian businesses want to invest. Uh, and it just remains you know, a favored uh, uh, location for, for so much, uh, of outgoing Norwegian uh, activity, and I'm certain that will remain uh, also in, in the future. And just a few numbers to, to illustrate the, the scope of the relationship, so to say. There are, I believe, approximately 15 to 20,000 Brits currently living in Norway, about the same number of Norwegian citizens living in uh, the UK. 
If you look at uh, bilateral trade, for example, uh, the value uh, just in goods in 2019 uh, of, of Norwegian exports to the UK was 220 billion Norwegian uh, kroner in exported goods, add another 40 billion in services. Uh, and uh, the investments of the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, for example, in, in, uh, in uh, the UK uh, is about 750, 800 billion Norwegian kroner. So the, the scope of the economic relationship alone is, is huge. And looking at, at history, as also the ambassador said, uh, I would say you know, geography was very much a part of that. Uh, you have the North Sea uniting us, not dividing us. Uh, and we are both nations with a very strong maritime outgoing tradition based on on trade uh, based on uh, our position as as coastal states uh, and the sea continues to play an important part of our culture and our economies and i think that will be increasingly so as we go forward because this maritime dimension uh, it serves in a sense as a, as a blue thread I would say in, in the direction of which the relationship is going to evolve going forward. It's going to be highly relevant. Looking at the current situation, you see that oil, gas, uh, most of it, of course, offshore and re related services sectors is a huge part of the economic uh, relationship. Seafood is important for, for Norway fisheries. Uh, but today we are also seeing new ways of uh, harvesting uh, resources from the sea. Norwegian investments have helped build the UK offshore wind sector. It's now the largest in the world and it will continue to grow. Offshore wind production is uh, offering not only renewable energy, but it's a it's a whole new uh, it's a whole new uh, part of uh, for closer cooperation in business and technology for uh, Norway and, and the UK. Of course, we followed the Prime Minister's speech to the Conservative uh, Party conference with, with great interest. Uh, and the policies are you know, very, very well aligned. Uh, when it comes to renewables, when it comes to a focus on, on hydrogen, when it comes to a focus on, on the blue economy, there is a huge potential there, obviously, for new economic, technological and industrial cooperation that I think will define a lot of the, of the future uh, bilateral relationship in, in, in those sectors. Already more than 300 Norwegian companies are present in the UK, of which 100 are situated in, in Scotland. And a large amount of these companies already uh, work within the energy uh, sector. Uh, the UK is Norway's biggest gas customer. Uh, at the UK's top foreign oil and gas supplier, Norway is, is vital for the UK, UK energy security, providing 37% of UK gas supply and 33% of, of crude oil supply in, in 2018. And of course, uh, electricity uh, interconnection par uh, partner with, with North Sea Link completes in 2021. And we'll see how that uh, develops, but uh, also an, a very, very interesting part of the relationship. We are key partners in developing uh, carbon capture, usage and storage uh, and on the international, international climate uh, targets, uh, including the Paris Agreement. And of course, this is very much at the top of the international agenda uh, and the international agenda here in Norway as we as we speak, so to say. The UK is Norway's second big, biggest research partner. We see uh, data is important in taking forward, bringing the, uh, the research and development and innovation uh, agenda forward. So I think on, on the economic and uh, technological industrial cooperation, it's, it's deep expanding uh, and with still a lot of, of potential. Also looking at the, at the political issues, uh, Norway and the UK has always been not only like-minded, but close allies and, and partners. We share a vision of a safer and more just world. Uh, we have always cooperated very closely within international organizations. Uh, and we look forward to developing that cooperation uh, as we step into the Security Council from uh, the 1st of January 20, uh, 2021. As the ambassador also said, we are world leaders when it comes to development aid. Uh, we have been at the forefront of granting debt relief as one example. Uh, and also we share uh, a lot of, of policies and priorities. Uh, education being very key uh, in both our development po policies and especially education for, for girls, where the UK has really been a, a sort of world leader in, in bringing that important topic to the, to the top of the, the agenda. The defense and security issues is also a, a key part of, of the relationship. 
We both see NATO as uh, vital to uh, not only European but transatlantic security. We are uh, keen proponents of uh, transatlanticism and the need to keep uh, the US engaged in, in European uh, security. British and, and other armed, allied armed forces have a long tradition to uh, train and exercise in Norway. We are very happy to see that developing and evolving into to, uh, uh, a new uh, framework, so to say, uh, with our troops uh, increasingly uh, exercising to, together, not only in Norway, as the ambassador also said. So there is a very close dialogue on security policies. Uh, and NATO is, of course, at the very heart of that. And looking, looking back to, I would say, especially the last decade, we have also seen a very uh, you know, joint, uh, an approach with very joint priorities between the UK and, and Norway, not least related to uh, the developing uh, security situation in the North Atlantic, sort of bringing the strategic importance of this uh, area back on the radar in, in uh, NATO HQ and in, uh, in shape. Uh, and also in uh, reforming the NATO command structure and the maritime uh, doctrine of the alliance to meet with evolving threats. So this close cooperation takes on an added importance in light of the challenging uh, and increasingly challenging security situation that we see around Europe. And we expect the UK to attach even greater importance to NATO. Uh, as well as bilateral and regional co cooperation post-Brexit. Post I think that is, is natural and a stated policy from, from the UK side. And the ambassador mentioned also uh, Jeff and Nor uh, Northern Group as, as examples of the regional cooperation at the sort of sub-NATO level. Uh, we also welcome uh, the UK's uh, increased interest in Arctic security. Uh, we welcome that. Uh, we are very happy to host the, uh, the Royal Marine Corps. Uh, we have the clockwork arrangement with, with helicopter training in, in Bardufoss, uh, and we are sailing together uh, doing uh, maritime operations in the north. Uh, and of course, for, for Norway and, and for, for the Alliance, it is crucial to, to uphold the balance between deterrence and reassurance in our, in our near areas. And I think that is also something that, that is very much on, on the uh, agenda in, in London and sort of striking that balance, not least in our relationship to, to Russia. Uh, and also on when it comes to to uh, how we can work together, uh, developing our military capabilities, uh, we have been very happy to see the UK re-establishing their maritime patrol aircraft uh, capabilities, for example. It's an area where we are looking forward to a very uh, strong, tight cooperation uh, going forward, uh, as well as uh, both our countries now uh, introducing the F-35 uh, fighter aircraft, actually flying the first identical fighter aircraft for the first time since the 1940s, where we both flew the Spitfire. So uh, it's it's uh, back to the future, so to say. A few words uh, then on, on the bilateral aspects of, of Brexit, because when leaving the EU, the UK is, is of course also leaving the EA agreement. And that has been sort of the, the main framework to uh, for, for a lot uh, of the relationship. It's not the only one, uh, and it's, uh, but it has been important for uh, for the time it has been in function. Uh, and given the the given Brexit, of course, we need to to uh, to reestablish some of those uh, connections that will now uh, that will now end. So for that reason, Brexit has also or is also important to to Norway, and every single Norwegian ministry is. Uh, working to ensure that we protect the interests of Norwegian citizens, Norwegian businesses, as we together create the conditions for our uh, continued cooperation with the UK and our strong partnership. So because we are still in the, within the transition period, very little has changed so far. But of course, that comes to an end now in, in three months time. So uh, we need to have arrangements in place to ensure that we can still trade on beneficial terms that uh, Airplanes can uh, take off in London and land in Oslo and, and vice versa, and that we are able to cooperate on, on uh, issues such as research and education and, and so on. We have made, I think we made an important early step in ensuring that the rights of our respective citizens will be uh, fully respected uh, in the case of, of Brexit. So if you are a Norwegian currently living in the UK or a British citizen currently living in, in Norway, uh, very little will change for you and you will be welcome to, to stay where you are. 
But still, I think we have to recognize that there will be some inevitable changes. Uh, of course, specifically related to, to the UK leaving the common market uh, and, and what that entails. So we need a new free trade agreement to make sure that our uh, relationships uh, are not disrupted. And I think on, on, on everything we have done on preparing for, for Brexit, this has been the one issue that we have been, that we are working and have been working the most on. And our goal if, is of course to have the new free trade agreement ready as soon as, uh, as possible in order for it to, to enter into for, force on, on January 1st next year. So that, that there will be no disruptions uh, between the transition period and and uh, a new agreement. But we are, and we have to admit that, very short on, on time. As the ambassador said, we have made huge progress in a very short uh, time frame. Normally, these agreements take uh, years. That has not been the luxury we, we've uh, had this time, but we have made huge progress. But we need to, to sort of finish, uh, finish it up and, and tie the last, uh, last uh, knots. That is still a, a uh, possibility, but it is also a possibility that it will not be ready uh, in time for us to make the necessary formal procedures, especially with, with Parliament. So we need also to prepare for the possibility of, of having some kind of, of bridge. Uh, and I think we are, but we are, you know, we are jointly and mutually interested in uh, getting this done uh, as uh, soon and as substantially as, as possible. And we are working full speed together on this, uh, basically as we as we speak. So, uh, in all our preparations for Brexit, our aim, and uh, I know it's a, it's a shared, shared aim, is to maintain the highest level, possible level of cooperation uh, between our two countries, and I'm sure we'll, we'll succeed in that. So to sum up, it's an extremely strong, uh, mutually beneficial friendship and relationship. It's historical, but it also has great uh, potential for, for the future, and we look forward to, to working with uh, our close uh, friend and partner. Thank you very much. Let's move directly on to our final introductory remarks from senior researcher at NUPI, Kirsten Haugevik. For the introduction. Um, so eight years ago, in 2012, I was part of a book project which was called The Forgotten Partnership, Britain and Norway in a Changing World. And that book set out from the observation that there was very little public attention directed at the relationship between Britain and Norway as such. It was characterized, uh, as one prominent insider observed, by a certain benign neglect. So yes, Norwegians loved British football. Yes, many Norwegians studied at, the, at British universities. And yes, Norwegian newspapers followed British politics very closely and with more passion, perhaps, than they followed politics in many other European states. So the narrative underpinning the relationship, as I think you have all mentioned, um, has been a narrative about shared history, about mutual understanding, about joint interests, about similar identities, and a general sense of this, this concept of being like-minded, as I think you both also alluded to. So Britain and Norway are Northern European states who see the world through somewhat similar lenses. So what does that mean for everyday politics and everyday practice? And our di diagnosis back in 2012 was that there were few urgent matters in the relationship that required following up. So there were very few issues in a sense that put the relationship on top, top of the agenda because it was working quite well. It was working sort of on the back stage of international politics rather than the front stage. So historically, security was a key driver in the relationship through the 1960s and 1970s, economic policies took more center stage. And then in recent years, especially energy has become an important part of the relationship. And when Britain joined the European Economic Community in 1973 and Norway remained outside following its referendum, the two states kind of parted ways as EC outsiders. And if you study Norwegian political discourse in the ensuing decades, then I think it becomes quite evident that Britain in a sense in Norwegian political discourse was absorbed by the EC. So there wasn't as much specific attention to the bilateral relationship because it was more about talking about European partners as a more general group. And the bilateral relationship received somewhat less attention in this period. Um, so, and for Britain, one could perhaps argue that intra-EU diplomacy sort of came to, to take a lot of the attention as well. 
perhaps at the cost of individual bilateral relationships. And in 1987, I think it's interesting to, to quote, a leading Norwegian conservative MP and later prime minister, Jan Per Syse, offered a rare reflection on how Norway's position as an EC outsider had influenced its relations with individual, uh, with individual European allies such as Britain. And I will read it because I think it's high re highly relevant as a context to what we're discussing here today. He said, quote, Norway may be in danger of falling outside the new network of contacts that are emerging in Europe. It means a lot for society's thinking and reaction patterns that researchers and ministers, parliamentarians and civil servants, teachers and journalists meet each other on a regular and frequent basis. Norway stands on the periphery of this relatively rapid and real integration of the society in West, societies in Western Europe, and therefore also on the sidelines of the decisions that are made. And we come to the essence here. It is of particular significance for Norway that Britain, traditionally our most important partner outside the Nordic region, is giving its participation in the EC increasingly higher political priority." Unquote. Now, Brexit has made this observation less relevant, but in a way it also summarizes quite neatly why the British-Norwegian relationship now is back on the agenda for both states. Since the Brexit referendum, or indeed even the debate that preceded it, the bilateral relationship has been much more in focus. And the bilateral interaction, I would argue, has also moved more to what we may call the front stage of the international diplomatic scene. So there have been more meetings at the top political level, there have been more handshakes, more photo opportunities, and also far more seminars and events, such as the one we have here today, where we sort of talk about the bilateral relationship as such. And there's a massive detailed coverage, as you mentioned, Mr. Ambassador, of British politics in the Norwegian press. And it's not only about Brexit, even though I agree with you that it's also been quite detailed about the negotiations and different individual steps. But there's much more attention to the bilateral relationship itself, politically, security-wise, economically, and also diplomatically. And meanwhile, I would say that Norway has also moved up on the UK's agenda as a reference point, as a fellow outsider, perhaps. It's important to stress, and I think you all have, that Brexit is not the only game-changing factor here. There's a greater sense of uncertainty, of unpredictability in international politics, also in other areas. And I don't think I need to list them because you have all uh, alluded to those. And in all this, I think there's a need for an updated narrative about the British-Norwegian relationship, what this relationship should look like five years from now, 10 years from now. And before we open up the conversation, let me conclude by making three observations slash questions. And the first observation is that nurturing bilateral partnerships take time. So the Norwegian-British relationship was always an asymmetric relationship in the sense that Norway was always the junior partner. And Norway's former foreign minister, Torvald Stoltenberg, once observed that Britain did not have an explicit small state policy in the Cold War era. And therefore, the Nordic states had drifted in the direction of Germany as a key partner in the EU. Well, after Brexit, Britain will have far more bilateral partners in Europe to attend to, uh, we can say. Uh, and it will need to have a different kind of diplomatic presence in Brussels as well. And in my study of special relationships in world politics, I argue that it's, it's kind of the junior partner that keeps alive in these asymmetric relationships, the junior partner that keeps alive this idea of the specialness in the public sphere in between high level meetings. But it often falls upon the senior party to recognize and uh, confirm the relationship. So this is a dynamic that's, that's common to, to many relationships in world politics. But my question, I suppose, would be, um, for Britain post-Brexit, how many special relationships with smaller European states can Britain maintain after Brexit? Because in a sense, it's part of also the global Britain strategy to nurture these new bilateral relationships. And then, of course, many countries like Norway would like to be first in line uh, and require the attention. So that could be attention in British politics in terms of deciding where to go when and, and how to prioritize. My second observation is that a key pillar in the British-Norwegian relationship, and I think you mentioned this, uh, Mr. State Secretary, is the security relationship and the shared commitment to Atlanticism. But 
as we know, the U.S. approach, or at least the U.S. rhetoric around NATO, has changed somewhat in recent years. And the question then would be how much of the bilateral UK-Norway relationship rests on the framework of NATO and the continued commitment of the United States. So how strong is the bilateral relationship sort of away from that context? We do not, not, uh, do not yet know, of course, the, the results of the American presidential election, but we could imagine that if it's a continued uh, four years with the current administration, then we might also see some changes in how NATO is, is presented and how NATO is, is approached. And finally, Britain and Norway have had historically similar approaches to European integration, but now they have kind of switched positions. Because while Britain is on the inside and seeking more autonomy by leaving the EU, Norway has for all practical purposes moved closer to the EU in recent years. So while Norway wants to, as, as you mentioned, maintain good relations with both the EU and Britain, that would be the priority to have it both ways. Early on, Norwegian politicians also warned that if Norway was to choose sides, then the relationship with Europe could in some cases come first. So that would be my final question. So how uh, would Britain and Norway, in what ways would they prepare to manage bilateral friction should it occur? Because that sometimes happens between friends as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kristin Haugvik, and thank all of you for great introductions. You will, of course, be uh, I will allow you to respond to, to uh, each other's comments and remarks, of course, but we have 20 minutes left and there is quite some interest here in the in the chat. So I will also leave you with some questions to reflect upon. And I think uh, as in your talks in the chat, also the high north has been mentioned in the Arctic and especially the Norwegian relationship with Russia. So there is, of course, then the question of what uh, are the limits to British presence in Norway in the high north? So what are the opportunities, but also in thinking about uh, the p possibilities of aggressing, being aggressive towards Russia, to what extent can, can, can Britain be present in the high north? Uh, that's one question. And then also it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, to what ex uh, who is actually initiating this? This is something we're interesting, is interested in. Is, is, is the UK inviting itself or are we inviting, Norway inviting the UK? Um, and then this actually, uh, sort of uh, links up to another question that came in here about uh, also what uh, Kirsten Havik mentioned about the specialness, how special can it really be? And one question here pertained to the Nordics. Can we expect that Norway will be more special than the rest of the Nordic countries? I'll start with, yes. I'll start with that one. Um, I think that we've been grappling um, in London since the uh, referendum result with how will our relationship with all European states change, both those who are inside the EU and those who are outside? Um, and I think um, you know, what we are going to find ourselves having to do is look at special areas of, relation, of all the relationships which are particularly in common interests. And Norway is lucky in that respect that there are so many, uh, as we've all um, listed, so I don't think um, uh, that, you know, it would be useful even to claim that we have a special relationship with every single country that, that just becomes meaningless. But I think the relationship between the UK and Norway on energy, on uh, values agenda, on defence, all of those things could be termed special. So I think it will be, um, uh, there'll be some competition for uh, attention to different um, countries in Europe necessarily, um, but I think Norway is very well placed to um, grab the attention of the UK because of the common uh, interests. Should I just go uh, answer the point about the high Arctic as well and then others can, um, can come in? I mean, I think that um, Norway and UK share a kind of common picture of what the threat is to uh, our region uh, and specifically uh, from Russia and that threat um, is what should define our common action. I think it is, it, there is no question of um, uh, of any, uh, either of us acting unilaterally and failing to uh, somehow have some wide consultation with all of concerned allies about how exactly we do this and how we should police uh, uh, the North. But as regards um, operations in different parts of the uh, North Atlantic in international waters, I mean, 
you know, our approach to that is guided by international law and the freedom of navigation, um, particularly. So um, I don't think we see any constraints uh, and it is not meant as a direct uh, provocation that we are simply um, uh, acting out what is laid out in international law. So, um, uh, but as, as, as it pertains to kind of a NATO plan for the defense of this particular area of the North Atlantic and Norway's coastline, very clearly, um, you know, we are um, we are there, we're willing to help, but that will be done in conjunction with um, Norway and other allies. So uh, I think you can see those two things as uh, slightly different. Just to pick up on the on the subject of the security cooperation, which which Kirsten also mentioned and, and relating to the question, because as was uh, as was said, a lot of it has, of course, been through NATO. Uh, but I would say that the, the sort of more purely bilateral security relationship has actually picked up uh, quite a bit uh, in, in the recent years. And a lot of that has to, I think, uh, to do with uh, you know, the threat perceptions, the, the very similar threat perceptions uh, as to the strategic picture in the, in the North Atlantic. It has to do with, with the capabilities that we are now both uh, procuring, but it's all. Of course, it has also always been close. Uh, Norwegian officers have been been trained in in UK defence uh, institutions for for decades. Uh, you have uh, you know joint participation in in uh, meetings. You have uh, the Norwegian uh, Navy officers are actually certified uh, through through the British system in in uh, the the joint war, I believe, uh, exercises and and those pr the processes in in, in the UK. And of course, also on uh, a lot on on uh, other aspects of of the security cooperation as well, uh, and the presence of of the Marine Corps and, and other British uh, units in in Norway for training, which has been ongoing for for decades, uh, going back to the 50s with the Royal Marine Corps and and the 60s with with the helicopter training in in, in Bardufoss, and of course, uh, all. Training and exercise happening on Norwegian soil and Norwegian territory is by invitation, of course. That is, but that has always been a, part, a key part of the Norwegian uh, defense concept. You know, we uh, wish to train with with allies and, and partners uh, on Norwegian territory and provide uh, our infrastructure and uh, our facilities for for training for for allies. Uh, which is also beneficial for our own security, of course, and it's been a, a hugely, I think, uh, mutually beneficial uh, cooperation for for years. And then the U UK, of course, also does its uh, its own operations, uh, but uh, I would say very closely coordinated with with us and also with NATO and, and other allies. Uh, and some of that has to do with with freedom of navigation, uh, which is also uh, an issue in in the high north. Uh, this is an ocean. Uh, most parts of it is going to be is international uh, waters, uh, and of course that is, uh, in a sense, a very natural development. Also, given the the developments in in the security picture in in the region, so it's it's a combination. But I would say we are we are very well co coordinated and maintain a very close dialogue. Uh, also, as I said, into to maintaining this uh, balance between uh, deterrence and uh, and dialogue. Uh, in our in our region, so uh, the security co cooperation is is uh, I would say also increasing uh, even outside the NATO framework. Thank you very much. Um, I'll jump into the team's uh, chat here because we have uh, there are some liking going on and some questions and and two of the most liked questions now pertains to climate change. So I'd like to ask those two questions, uh, one detailed and one more overall question. Um, one is from Jens Schabacher, who writes uh, the following. UK and Norway are world leading in green shipping. As a German environmentalist, I want to ask, will the kingdoms of Britain and Norway play a strong role in green shipping in the European Union also in the future? And then there is an anonymous question, but perhaps a good one. How do Norway and the UK plan on working together to tackle climate change, especially given the UK's reliance on Norwegian oil and gas? You can start. Um, I'll start with the second one. I think um, what is we also have an oil and gas industry um, and that's been uh, important to the economy and uh, particularly in parts of Scotland uh, for, for many years. What I think um, people expect from us um, is that we accelerate a move to um, low emissions and to um, carbon neutral energy as quickly as we can, but that we do so in as transparent and predictable a way as possible. 
Now, um, the industry um, doesn't need to be uh, frightened about that. And indeed, um, I don't think they are on either side of the uh, North Sea divide because a lot of the technology that will enable us to accelerate uh, a move into um, hydrogen and CCUS and um, uh, more wind energy is um, transferable technology that comes from the oil and gas experience. Um, so that's one of the reasons why the UK and Norway are both um, at the forefront of some of these um, developments. So um, yes, both economies benefit from oil and gas revenues now, but I think both countries also understand that we can't continue to do that uh, long into the future without a predictable um, move towards uh, greener energy um, sources that are sustainable for the future. So I think uh, um, that what was the question from uh, Jens again? If Norway and the UK will be um, uh, play a strong role in the green shipping in the European Union. I know that's a really, really interesting area and something I've been really gratified to see in Norway is that it is the industry themselves, the shipping industry themselves, which has pioneered um, accelerated moves towards um, greener shipping solutions. Uh, and that is really just fantastic to see. That is that is an example that we all need to see of industry um, leading by example and understanding where the future lies and making its own moves to get there. So you see fantastic use of electric ferries in, in Norway uh, and you see long-term plans to develop um, not just autonomous um, shipping, but also hydrogen and ammonia uh, driven shipping. And these, I think, are really, really um, uh, clear areas where the international shipping industry is going to need to move over the uh, over the longer term. But we can't um, say that's something for the future. We need to move now in developing that te technology to make it happen. So um, we have a, a major industrial hydrogen industrial um, park that's being um, developed uh, with Equinor in the lead um, in Humber. And part of that will be an ammonia plant, um, a carbon neutral ammonia plant, producing ammonia for um, uh, for shipping to replace diesel. So, you know, these moves are happening and I think the UK and Norway working together is making them happen faster. And I really, really applaud that. No, I, again, I agree completely with, with the ambassador. And of course we are, all countries are in the middle of this huge shift, so to say, when it comes to, to energy policies. Uh, and recognize the need to make that move into a more uh, low emission, uh, carbon neutral uh, production and, and the usage of, of, of energy. Uh, it's on the agenda in the UK, uh, very clearly illustrated with the Prime Minister's speech. It's on the agenda in Norway, as you saw in, in the budget, which was uh, presented uh, yesterday. Uh, huge uh, investment in, in CCS, for example. Uh, and also in in uh, in sort of making this uh, this transition, but I would also say that there is a, a a joint understanding that you know hydrocarbons are going to be with us for for some time yet, uh, not least in the form of natural gas, which I think we both see as a sort of part of the bridge between uh, a carbon-based uh, energy sector and uh, a fully renewable uh, low emissions. Uh, energy sector at some point in in the future, and in that part, it is you know important for Norway uh, to maintain our role as a predictable, stable, non-political provider of energy to Europe, to the UK, but also to to the rest of of Europe, not least in the form of of natural gas gas. Uh, and it also can can of course play a role when it comes to to uh, the development of hydrogen technology, for example, in the form of of uh, blue hydrogen uh, made made with the use of of natural gas gas. So uh, when it comes to green shipping, uh, very much an ongoing development. Uh, also very glad to see the innovation being driven by uh, the industry itself. But I think the Norwegian examples is also how uh, government standards and regulations and government tenders, for example, can help drive uh, technological development in the form of, of electrical uh, non-emissions ferries, for example, uh, as part of a, of a public tender for, for ferry transportation. So it's, a, it's an example of, of how uh, industry and government can, can work together in driving a development that I think will have you know, has huge potential also on, on a global scale.
Thank you very much. Uh, we also have a question uh, to slightly shift uh, to the negotiations and sort of the, the place we're at right now. Um, Arne Melkio, the researcher at NUPI, has asked about the fisheries agreement. So he wanted to know if you can explain either of you or both um, sort of that this agreement that's been made uh, will be based on annual Norway UK negotiations, right, on quotas and quota exchanges, but also a tripartite UK Norway EU agreement on other aspects. So I was wondering if you can explain that in a bit more detail. And I think it alludes to maybe a bigger question that we we, we need to ask here is what what if this goes wrong? What, so you talk about progress, right, in these negotiations, but we know there's a serious scarcity of time. What happens if Norway and the UK are not able to agree and have a, uh, an agreement ready for January? What happens if the EU and the UK are unable? And how does that affect the Norwegian uh, agreement? Big question, uh, but I'd like to challenge both of you on it. Basta, would you like to? Or? Any of a, a few words perhaps on the fisheries agreement first because yeah. what we have uh, negotiated and what i think has it's uh it's been a very good example of constructive uh engagement from from both sides uh, we have negotiated a framework agreement we have established the principles and the framework for uh, the substance which is to follow in the form of, of access and quotas and uh, zones and and sort of the practicalities of a future fisheries agreement. So, and I think as the ambassador also said in his uh, remarks, uh, it is, you know, science based, facts based, uh, principled approach to how uh, the bilateral fisheries questions are going to be resolved as we sort of move along in the substantive uh, negotiations going forward. Uh, and that is, I think, a key step in sort of bringing uh, that uh, forward. Uh, a trilateral agreement, uh, you know, would be the preferred next step. I hope we can get there uh, in the same uh, way, uh, in the same sort of principled, uh, overarching uh, manner with the UK, EU, Norway, and sort of trilateral uh, agreement. Uh, but of course, a lot of the, the one that sort of follows uh, from the other as, as well. Uh, but we have established a, a mutual, uh, I think, uh, framework for for the future uh, fisheries uh, relationship, which is uh, an important step. Yeah, I mean, the, the question Anna asks is, is around, one of the questions was around what happens if uh, UK and Norway can't agree? I mean, I think the fact is that um, uh, NFD here has been talking to um, DEFRA, our ministry, and Marine Scotland for many years about these things, and we have always agreed a common approach to how these things should be managed. And now that we have the ability to um, do that directly as, an, as a, a sovereign, independent coastal state uh, managing its own fisheries, I don't see that that will be a problem. We uh, can discuss issues of um, one scientist says the stock is moving in this direction at that speed and another one says it's moving slightly differently. Well, those are things that are, are very easy to uh, overcome and to bridge, particularly when both sides have such an interest in reaching shared agreements on these things. So I absolutely don't foresee any um, problem in the UK and Norway reaching the detail of those um, uh, agreements when we have already decided it should be based on um, uh, science and zonal attachment. Um, now, that is by far for Norway the most important fisheries agreement because the vast majority of the quota that Norway received from the EU was in British waters. Um, very little of it is in other waters in the EU, but nevertheless there is some and there is clearly a triangular uh, relationship. Um, so the EU and Norway and the UK will have to um, decide on some stocks uh, in the North Sea and uh, uh, how that is uh, how that is all managed. Currently, how that will work between the UK and Norway is clear. Uh, how we will be able to work that with the EU is not yet clear, but um, I think uh, uh, we should be clear that it's um, it's sorted with Norway. It's going to um, work very well with Norway. Thank you very much. We are uh, slowly running out of time, but I would like to invite you all to sort of sum up and have a few seconds to uh, to finish your your statements uh, in this uh, seminar before we end and maybe we'll start with State Secretary Hobosan. Well, I think we, we covered uh, the most important uh, subjects uh, and 
Christian said that you know eight years ago uh, this was a relationship uh, of of benign neglect. I, I'm I would certainly say we can't say that uh, anymore to the extent that it has uh, ever been through. It's it's very much at the forefront of uh, Norwegian uh, discussions, uh, Norwegian in interest right now, uh, and my understanding it's. To a certain extent, the same in, in in London, though we are we are of course one of of many. Uh, but as the the ambassador said uh, initially, I think you know, we need to to keep working on how we can evolve, how we can evolve from you know not only being uh, sort of in that cozy, uh, mutually understanding uh, corner, to creating a uh, strong. Uh, close uh, relationship for the 21st century. And I think a lot of the uh, subjects we have touched upon today are going to be cornerstones of the relationship going forward. Uh, and I am certain that we will continue to develop the relationship to the to our mutual benefits. Yes, um, let me just, uh, I think, repeat the point that I made. I, I think I said earlier that uh, the UK and Norway is in need of some sort of new narrative, a sort of post-Brexit phase. Uh, where the two countries are a bit different in relation to one another than they were back 75 years ago when, when things looked quite different in, in politics. <clears throat> so I think diplomacy is going to be much more important. That's good news, I suppose, for somebody who's ambassador for the UK. I think diplomacy is going to play a much larger role uh, and perhaps require a little bit more of innovation now that we are faced with actually a, a deep ongoing crisis in terms of COVID-19, which makes it much harder to, to meet face to face. This is an exception, a welcome exception that we get to meet in the same room. Uh, and I think that could, you know, make things more complicated if there are in fact friction, as Avin mentioned, um, because very often such friction is resolved in the public by having, you know, face to face meetings, performances in the public sphere. And that's more difficult when you have face, uh, not have face to face meetings, when you meet on Teams and Zoom on, and all these nice digital tools, but don't let you uh, communicate that in the same sense. Um, so I think it's going to be an exciting period. I think fisheries is a, it's a key to sort of getting things on, on track uh, because it is in a very important area, as we know, and something that Norwegians are very interested in as well. Um, but that being said, I, I do think, you know, we're probably going to hear more about the World War II. We're probably going to hear more about the royal ties. We're probably going to hear more about British football also in the time to come. I don't think that old narrative is, is quite outdated yet, but hopefully there will be also something new to be added to the dynamics. Thank you. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with um, talking about what has established our relationship. It's just you need things to build on top of foundations. Foundations are useless on their own. Uh, Kristen talked about benign uh, neglect and then refined it slightly to say that perhaps that just meant that the relationship was ticking over nicely without being particularly spectacular or exciting. But I think we have a chance to do better than that now. Uh, and I think the um, I think the uh, handshakes and the meetings when they can happen are important. Uh, they give um, a certain political direction to uh, the relationship. But what is really important is the people, ordinary people on both sides of the North Sea, simply voting with their feet. Businesses doing business uh, between the two countries, students deciding to study in each other's countries, historians being interested in each other's uh, approaches to uh, issues and our common values agenda, proving that we can work together on the international stage to counter threats to our defence and security uh, and to raise prosperity, not just here at home, but through solidarity in the uh, wider world as well. So I what I have, uh, the ambition that I have for the relationship is to go from mundane and ticking over to one that will make people sit up and notice that the UK and Norway are working together on so many different levels um, to uh, contribute to our defence and make a difference in the world. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, what remains is to thank you for participating. It is very interesting to discuss these matters with, with Global Britain uh, and we look forward to more discussions in the future. And to those of you who joined at home, thank you for joining and see you soon again.